Welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by ECIS. ECIS has been established for 55 years as a not-for-profit organisation. We have over 500 members in 78 countries. My name is Jo Whitson and I am Head of Events here at ECIS. It is my pleasure to introduce today's webinar. We will be sharing a recording of today's webinar and there will be an opportunity at the end to ask questions via the chat box. Let me introduce our experts for today, Matt and Jill. Matt believes that people are capable of far bigger leadership roles and lives than they ever dare to let themselves believe. In his playful yet humble approach, he brings great trust and energy to MSB. His life as a senior leader in secondary schools in the UK and overseas gave him a deep understanding of what makes engaging learning and leadership. And Jill Kelly. Jill knows what it means to lead and learn. And to learn. As a former head teacher of three different and diverse schools, she brings great creativity inside and gravitas to those she works with. Her soulful yet sassy approach to life is reflected in her fundamental belief in the innate ability of people to change themselves in their setting. I always find Matt and Jill's webinar such a positive experience, so please pop your phones away and switch off your emails. This next hour is an opportunity to focus on these principles and you. Please welcome me in joining over and handing over to Matt and Jill. Thanks very much, and uh, it's very nice to be here um, again. I think this is our third ECIS webinar, and I always think those introductions make me feel like I'm on blind date for anyone it, who's... It, it, it's a bit disturbing, but yes. Anyone, yeah, anyone who's <laughs> old enough to remember blind date. Um, so uh, today we're going to uh, take you through um, an introduction to how coaching can be used in school settings, um, and we're going to do that based on our experience of doing so with a range of schools. Um, and uh, what we do as Making Stuff Better is provide leadership coaching to international schools. Um, Jill, um, as Joe alluded to, Jill and I used to run schools. We understand schools. We know what it is to run schools, both in the UK and overseas. Um, and now we provide uh, leadership coaching and coach training for international schools. And goodness me, is it a busy time. With a lot of challenges faced by school leaders, a lot of we are we are very busy at the moment coaching a lot of people around in different corners of the world. Um, but today is about how for us to allow you to think about how you might use coaching in your school and to better understand some of the outcomes because um, it feels like a, a prescient time in which to start to improve the quality of conversations and the way in which people interact with each other. Um, in school environments. Coaching is an uh, interesting beast and has grown um, rapidly in the last 20 to 30 years, primarily from um, the west coast of the US. Um, but we're now finding that schools um, in a whole range of cultures are turning to co coaching for a whole range of reasons. And we're going to look at those in a bit more detail. Um, but the time certainly seems to be ripe um, for schools to start to introduce coaching into their, into their um, schools because um, if we don't know anything else, we do know that things are not staying the same for very long at the moment and the ability to talk through and process um, this rapid change um, with someone else does seem to be a very powerful mechanism. And with all the current uncertainty that exists, um, both on a very personal level, we all experience huge levels of uncertainty around where we're gonna live, how we're gonna work, um, the immediate threats of the virus itself, the impact on its community, the impact on our community and our friends and our family. You know, we're going through this period where we're facing huge reorganization and questions around our own um, well-being, but we're also making and um, have, having to take very big decisions around our professional lives, particularly the impact that those decisions make on young people and on peers. So coaching seems like a healthy and um, timely introduction for a lot of schools at the moment. And um, we're going to explain to you why that might be. And we'll do that in a really simple way. Um, we'll give you some examples of the roles in which um, coaching can play in schools. Um, we'll give you some examples of those, some real life examples of how those have been used. Um, and as Joe said, there's some time at the end for any questions and answers, but um, we'll keep it as light as we can please do jump in the chat or in the Q&A function on Zoom and um, ask any questions as they go and we'll, we, we can take a pause and as we go along as well. 
So what is coaching, Jill? What is coaching? Uh, coaching is sometimes completely misunderstood. Uh, and we're just going to take you through what, what it actually is and what it is not. Um, it is not, it really is not about fixing people. And I know if you work in schools uh, that as teachers, educators, we are there to fix, to demonstrate, to model, to uh, clarify misconceptions and misunderstandings. Um, we're not, uh, coaching is not about that. Coaching is not about fixing the individual. People arrive to coaching already creative, resourceful and whole as human beings. What coaching does, it, it takes the person who's in front of you, just like you look at any plant, a beautiful ancient tree there, uh, and we help them grow. So we take them from the point in which we meet them and we take them to where we help facilitate and take them to the, the goals they've set themselves where they want to be. So it's about the present moment and growth. The coach has a really privileged position to be in. Uh, we work very well, we'll take you through some of these skills in a moment, but listening is, is a key one. So a coach doesn't instruct. Um, it's slightly different from um, an athletics coach. Um, an, athle an athletics coach or running coach, they might talk about how they know how to run, for example. They'll tell you how to run and become a better runner. Um, uh, this kind of coaching is about pulling from your client what it is they want to achieve creating the space for them to reflect um, and then take them towards conscious choice to go towards their, to their end goals. And ultimately it's about coming above the line. This thing about being conscious, we spend our lives sometimes sleepwalking through our lives um, and we have moments of consciousness where we think, is this what I want? Or, hey, this is great, this is exactly what I want, let's carry on with this. Um, but with life taking over and what I call lockdown beige syndrome, where you end up in four walls, which takes away from you sometimes the, the troughs and the peaks of life, you can quite easily slip below that line, um, below the waterline, to be drowning almost in unconsciousness. So what coaching does is it lifts you out of the water above that line so you can breathe um, and be conscious in the choices that you make. So with that in mind, it's kind of quite another way of looking at it is thinking about what coaching isn't um, and what coaching is not is focused on the past. So it doesn't, go, doesn't take us backwards. It doesn't take us back in time and help us to unpick something that has happened. It's not diagnostic in that sense. Um, and as a result, it's not counselling. And there, there is a um, lot of overlaps and lots of similarities between counselling and coaching and it can be um, enormously cathartic um, to be coached. Um, it can be a huge release. Um, you might feel like you are receiving counsel, um, but it's not a clinical count, uh, process like counseling is. Um, and therefore it's not a form of therapy. And again, it can feel therapeutic with a lowercase t, but it is not a clinical therapy. Um, and it's not mentoring. And mentoring is ultimately, as Jill alluded to, the exchange of knowledge. Um, when you, I know this, I'll show you how to do this. I've done this before, I'll show you how to do this. Um, uh, to put it another way, if we think about um, the thought process in mentoring, as I've just alluded to, we talk about our experience. Um, in teaching, we talk about, you know, I'm an expert, I've accomplished this, or I, I have the source of knowledge and I will pass it over. Counseling, we go back, and we help people heal from a particular moment in time. Um, coaching is about the here and now. So coaching is about the what is here now and where would you like to go? So it's the present to the future. So a coaching conversation will always have its um, focus on what is happening now um, and how you might move forward. And the assumption in the coaching conversation is that you will always be growing forward in a positive way. It will always try and take you forward. Um, in, in counselling, for example, you may not need to do that. It might be about just healing what's happened in the past. And again, if it was a statement, then when you were mentoring, it would be, this is how I would do it. If you're teaching this, this is how to do it, this is how you should do it. Um, Counselling is more, you know, what happened, let's unpick it. And again, coaching is about what's, what's here, is it working for you, what might you do differently? It's always got that driving forward um, future focus. And again, just, you know, as another way of illustrating this, was the action involved in each of those processes. In mentoring, it's guidance and it's advice. In teaching, is 
I'm sure many of you are very skilled at, um, as a lot of people on here are teachers, it's about directing and offering method and technique information. A counselor will probe and get reflect and people to psychoanalyze and come to terms with something that's happened. Um, and in coaching, it's about exploring, experimenting, having a go at something, maybe trying to play with an idea to um, explore how your future might be different to the one that you're currently aligned with or the path that you want. How might you change direction? Um, it's always important to say, I think, though, that we rarely coach in a bubble. Um, and uh, too often coaching is seen, all these things are seen as separate entities. And what often happens, and it's completely right, is that people will move. People will move between um, mentoring and between coaching. Um, but at its core, what we're saying really is that coaching um, is really, really powerful tool in the right context. And I always say, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't coach someone out of a fire alarm. Um, you tell them, you give them the guidance and advice how to get out of a fire alarm. You, fire alarm. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't coach a year nine um, in a maths lesson around their introduction to a really complicated um, kind of mathematical equation. You would teach them how to do that. It wouldn't... It would be completely hopeless and unfair to try and coach them. Um, how would you like to solve the maths problem would not be useful or um, beneficial for that student. So we tend to operate on a spectrum um, in all of these uh, ways in which we support other people. Uh, but our experience of schools is that the mentoring and unsurprisingly the teaching muscle, if you like, is strongest. Um, the counselling is left quite often to one or two individuals who have a specific counselling qualification. And the coaching ends up being a catch-all description for lots and lots of other things. Um, and actually, if we can, if we can uh, uh, develop and grow the coaching muscles in people in schools, um, then, we, then we're ultimately adding another layer of um, tools to their toolkits that will allow them to be more effective mentors, more effective teachers, and more, um, more beneficial colleagues um, to have in the school. And I think ultimately the key difference between a mentoring relationship and coaching relationship is that coaching grows the person, not the problem. So when we think about coaching, we think about we're not going to focus on the problem. We're not going to focus on trying to unpick the problem. We're going to focus on what you've got as an individual and how we might allow you to develop and grow so that the problem becomes small. And uh, Jill always laughs at this because it's my attempt at art, but this is my best. I like doing this. This is my best way of, of illustrating what I mean by that. Oh, we've got a pink pen here, didn't expect that. So if this is the problem, if this is the step, and this is the person who's uh, being coached, um, here they, he or she is. Um, and let's just, you know, let's just make them a bit unhappy because they've got this big problem in front of them. Um, if we're mentoring them, then we'd say, oh, okay, I recognize this problem before. I know what this is. I've seen this before, I've faced that. What you need to do is one, two, three, four, five, and um, take these steps and you will overcome this problem. Whether this problem is getting promoted, it's having a difficult conversation with a parent, it's getting year seven to engage in a Shakespeare text, whatever it might be, whatever the challenge is, whatever the person feels stuck on. When we're in a mentoring or teaching relationship, we tend to say, here you go, one, two, three, four, five, A, B, C, do these things. Um, and again, in the right context, really useful. Where it's less useful is that what we know, because life works like this, is that something else comes along and something else comes along and so on and so forth. And that person will either need to be reminded of those steps or actually the problems for this, the steps for this problem and this problem and this problem could be completely different ones. And they've got to reinvent and revisit them each time. The beauty of coaching in the right context is if this is the problem, Oops, that was about to be a very small person. Um, if this is the problem, oh crikey. If this is the problem and this is the person, um, excuse my, my GCSI, GCSE art didn't go as planned. Um, if this is the problem and this is the person, then we grow the person, not the problem. And that is to say that actually we think about this person as having everything they need to overcome this problem. All we need to do is just grow them and grow them and make them feel absolutely sky high so that actually they can just take one big 
step or a series of small steps, whatever, they can get over that problem the next themselves so that the next time they face it and the next time they face it, they are already this big. So suddenly this massive big challenge in front of them doesn't seem quite as overwhelming. Um, and therefore coaching in the right context and done the right way can be a very sustainable um, uh, intervention in your school in a whole range of ways because it gives people the feeling that they've grown and that they've developed and now that they can take those challenges on um, themselves. So let me just go back to where we were. So we with, one of the key differences is that we grow the person, not the problem. And therefore, it's ultimately um, the coming together of two things. And we think of coaching in two ways. We think of it as a way of doing, and we get so tied up with doing in schools. We're super busy. It's, we're about skilling people up. It's about skilling up young people. We're always thinking of the doing. Um, and there is a whole load of doing involved in coaching, and we'll show you some of the doing shortly. Um, but it's also a way of being. And again, I think one of the gifts that we find when you introduce a coaching culture to a school is you start to get diff changes and differences in the way in which people behave um, because their mindset has changed. So it's not a whole series of things to do. It's always also a way of being. And very briefly, we build it on this model. We do. So this is um, many, many hours of coaching, training, reduced into three areas that we feel are very important. So the values that we have designed our model on are, are listed there, that we truly believe people are the resource of any organisation. And if you can get the people to transform, then of course it will it'll transform the organisation. Um, and then that goes to impact and that we believe that work is deeply personal. So it's that thing that teachers will um, do as the, what they'll, teachers will do what they're told to a mediocre level but they will do what they are passionate about to an exceptional level. So coaching is about uncovering what people's passions, people's desires, uh, and, and, and really working to where they are, not homogenized into a group called staff. Uh, the how is actually, yeah, as I said, creative, resourceful and whole. Are things aligned with their values? What using perspective, allowing people to reflect, act, then react, experiment, play, and by, really simple skills but doing them really well and in a very polished way so by listening and we'll show you we'll talk to you about that in a minute being curious using your intuition self-managing so important um focusing on your client's agenda what people want to talk about and the here and now not the past not the future but actually what's happening now and then we've got a whole lit load of um, coaching skills um, that we are currently teaching and training uh, a number of uh, schools in, international schools around the world, uh, uh, which have been really going down a storm. So a whole range of things there I've mentioned about listening, but, you know, accountability, bottom lining. Uh, we, we're going to take you through a couple of things in this webinar, but of course, um, it's a whole program that um, can be delivered in schools to address those. And when you introduce something like that into your school, what you find is that the coaching principles, the skills that you learn, just have an impact on a whole range of areas in school life. And it depending, doesn't matter where you start, you might bring coaching into your organization um, for people in leadership positions, but those skills will also then get transferred, transferred sorry, um, in conversations to other people, which will then hopefully improve their well-being. It'll also, if it's used in classrooms, it'll aid children's learning. It will also bring community together because people are speaking to each other with respect. They're properly listening and they're tuning into the individual in front of them. So you can't lose with coaching. Wherever you put it, it shines the light where it needs to go. And why do, well, people's, um, coaching in the past has had a bit of a, a Mm, I was going to say bad press. Um, I'm going to use phrases like hugging trees and carrying, walking around with crystals going, isn't this amazing? There is actually <laughs> a science behind it and there's a whole raft of research to back up the fact that it does make a difference. Um, coaching is based on neurological science uh, and there's a really strong base to suggest that it has a huge impact on schools. Um, you can see there, um, better performance, improved organisation of work. You can read English. Um, 
yeah, it uh, it works. It's good. It's good stuff. Okay, so there's some of the kind of background and the theoretical um, uh, and framework behind um, coaching and and why do it. Um, as we've said a couple of times, we also wanted to make sure that in the session we um, we show you some examples. So uh, the invitation now is is we're going to give you a couple of examples of the core skills involved in coaching. Um, and as we do so, I'd just like you to think about um, the impact that might have on your school. So if, this, if the skills we're about to demonstrate were more prevalent in your school community, what might the impact of that be? And the first one is um, listening. And listening is listening's a funny bit because everyone thinks that it's just like a slight anticlimax. What you're going to teach us to listen, Matt? Really? Um, you know, <laughs> I've been doing that for, for my entire life. And, and that is absolutely true, but there is a real skill to listening and listening effectively um, can have a huge impact on the quality of conversations that take place in your school. Um, and it is the absolute cornerstone of an effective coaching conversation. And that is because in coaching, we kind of see three levels of listening. We see level one, internal, level two, which we call focused, and level three, which we call global. Now, level one listening is really, really important um, listening. It's uh, the way in which we make friends. It's the way in which we find partners. It's the way in which we um, get on with others. It's the way in which we consistently go through life um, feeling like we're part of a tribe. And the reason for that is that level one listening is when the conversation is really all about me. So I'm listening to the other person um, but what I'm trying to do is work out how I fit into that other person, the information that other person has given me. So for, it might be, for example, um, you know, at the moment I'm jumping on calls with lots of people in different parts of the world. And very often the first thing that they talk about is the is level of restriction that's happening in their part of the world. And someone, I, I just had a, had a conversation this afternoon with someone in Singapore. They're explaining the kind of current status quo in Singapore. And I, in turn, will then give the current status quo um, in Scotland, which is where I am. And I do that and we all do that because it's the way in which we find common ground. Okay, this is happening in your part of the world. We've got something similar but slightly different happening in our part of the world. Um, you know, the classic level one conversa listening conversation is the first day back after a holiday in the days in which you're allowed to go on holiday. Where did you go? I went to Spain. Oh, interesting. We went to Spain two years ago. How did you find it? Yeah, well, I found it like this. It's the way in which we find common ground with our fellow humans, and it's a hugely valuable skill. And we spend most of our lives um, in level one listening. When we're thinking, of, we're trying to work out how the information we're receiving relates to us and how we can place ourselves um, in, that, in, in that conversation. Absolutely hopeless when it comes to coaching, um, because in a coaching conversation, we are trying to not make it all about me. I'm trying to make it all about you. And we call that level two listening, which is um, focused listening. And that is when we are really concentrating on making the conversation be about the other person. So if I take the examples I've just given, if I'm talking to someone in, uh, in Singapore about the restrictions in Singapore, um, if I'm in level one, I want to compare them to my restrictions. If I'm in level two in a coaching conversations, I want to think about what those restrictions mean for that person. Um, and I'm taking myself out of the conversation. Um, again, on paper, it sounds quite straightforward. In reality, very challenging to take ourselves out of the conversation and make the conversation about one thing and be okay with that. Be okay with that. Make that conversation about one person and let that go, not let our ego get in the way. Um, that can be a real challenge and it's a real skill that coaching um, brings to a school. Um, the consequence, though, is that the person who's being listened to feels like they really have got space to say what they need and to talk just for a bit of time about themselves. And if, I th if you think of level one listening at its worst, it's, it's the person who makes everything about them, about the conversation about them. So level one listening at its worst is, <laughs> in my experience, fairly abhorrent. It's that, you know, I think I was thinking about it as kind of, being in a bar for some reason, it involves having a drink and it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you say, someone will steal the conversation and take it back and make it about themselves. It's not a healthy conversation at all. So if we can have deliberate conversations where the person who is being coached 
knows that they've got the floor and they're not going to be interrupted and they're going to have the time to process their thoughts and their emotions, um, that it can have a really, really positive impact on both what they commit to do and on their well-being. But we can go even better than that. We can go even, we can go even higher than level two and we can go to level three, which is where the conversation and the listening is tuning into everything. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, I think I always think the best description I can give for this, um, particularly for educators, is um, that time when you're teaching a class and you are absolutely focused on um, helping a student at the front of the class, but your, your spidey senses, sometimes we call it, your, your Spider-Man sense, Spider-Woman sense, is scanning everything. So you know what's happening behind you, you know what's happening over this shoulder, you can hear what's happening in the corridor, you, can, um, you, know, you know what time it is on the clock, but you don't need to look at the clock because you've got a sense, um, you, you tune into the fact that it feels like this at this time every morning and it's gonna be break shortly. Um, it's that ability that um, educators have and you develop over time in a classroom to absolutely hold the attention of one child but know everything else that's going on around you. Um, and sometimes we talk about level three is just tuning into the energy. So you might be having a conversation with someone but you've already clocked the way in which they walked into the room. They might be telling you one thing but you can see that their shoulders are down, you can sense that their body language is telling you something else. Um, and and at no point do you think about how it relates to you. And at no point do you think about whether or not you have a place in the conversation because you're deliberately making the conversation all about them. And again, that might sound like a very minor thing, but it can have a huge impact on the person who's being listened to. Um, the op and it doesn't need to be for long. You know, the children, I, I often say, you know, some of the most powerful coaching we see can happen in a five or six minute period where someone is just able to hold the space for another person to say what they need to say. Um, and it's remarkable the impact it can have on the quality of conversations and relationships in schools. So yeah, I'm curious and I'd, I'd love if you're feeling courageous with a lowercase c because I hope we're not too terrifying. I'm just really interested to, to have any feedback on how you can jump in the chat or the Q&A. How powerful might it be to have Kind of level three listening embedded in your school if if you were able to move around your school or students were able to move around your school or peers were able to move around your school and um, know that there was opportunities for them to really be heard There's a lovely phrase in coaching that we use when we're in level three listening, which is let the silence do the work. And I'm just gonna let it do the work for another 15 seconds or so if anyone wants to jump in and add a reflection. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah says, I think we do this well in pockets. Mm. That's, a, that's an interesting observation, yeah. And sometimes I think it happens well in, by accident. And there's some people who have got a predisposition to doing it well. Um, I'm assuming by pockets, then, we, then you mean in that case, Sarah, that it's happening on and off, but not deliberately. Um, let me just, uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna ask you just to clarify that, Sarah. Um, I, I'm gonna turn the mic on if that's okay. I'm unmuting. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm trying to type, and it's not. I'm not fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, would well, you just uh, yeah. just uh, throw some some detail on that? I mean, I'm curious. Yes, I, I, I think the intentionality is the important point here. I think that we have in in our school some amazingly um, uh, skilled uh, listeners, um, um, whether that be staff or students, uh, and I think that. It's the intentionality of being able to um, create a culture of, of coaching that's uh, the important thing because then we um, impact one another. I think also that there's, there's a <clears throat> an element of the stakeholders within the school who are our parents um, uh, who, who sometimes get a little bit forgotten and um, rather than making parents the problem, actually being able to see that they they need to be listened to in a global way too. And they also need to be able to listen in a global way. So I think that's what I'm talking about. I think there's, there's some wonderful examples of uh, focused and global 
listening, um, but we need to be more intentional and, and um, consequent about it. <clears throat> mm, and it's that, yeah. con that coming above the line um, uh, concept of being conscious, consciously uh, making those, uh, having those conversations um, with people, um, which allow, and allow them to be heard, allow them to be seen, um, and very often can actually, if there's a conflict, it can calm it down, or if it's innovation and wanting to uh, do something a little bit radical or uh, thinking about ideas generation, it's really useful there as well. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Thanks, Sarah. And um, yeah. Sherika has just added in the chat, if this level of listening was part of our school culture, it would transform everything about the way we do things. Mm. And that level of learning that occurs by all. Wow, that's a, that's a powerful reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Sherika. And if you want to add or anyone wants, wants to verbally contribute at the end, uh, we'll make sure that we leave enough time to do so. Um, but I think that's a really, really, really helpful point. It's about, um, it's about intentionality. So Sarah's completely right. This, you, know, you can probably think of examples of this happening um, throughout your organisation, but it's about making a conscious decision as an organisation to introduce coaching and to use it um, in this way. Okay, so Jill, take us through reframing. Okay, so when we have a situation where a bad thing, in inverted commas, a, you feel like a bad thing has happened to you, um, one way of responding to a negative event is to go into a dark place or a deep dark hole and affirm everything around you as being negative and support your view that everything is negative. We can, however, and that, that often is, is operating for the part of our brain called the limbic system, which sees threat, perceives threat, and then encourages you to act in defense of that threat, uh, to protect yourself uh, or defense from that threat. So what reframing does is halt the, the limbic response and takes you to a different place to look at an event differently. And sorry, Matt, could you just go back to that slide about the barn? I think it's a beautiful phrase. My barn having burned down, I can now see the moon. Uh, instead of the, my barn having burned down, I have nothing to stop me getting wet and when it rains, actually, I can see the moon. Hooray! Very different way of looking at it. So thanks, Matt, if you're, we can go forward again. Um, so we are standing, there's a young person there standing, that we're standing in, the, feeling like they're standing in the shade of something. Um, like something is blocking out our sunlight. We can feel very negative in our life. Well, actually, we could look at things differently. And what if we saw things as a little bit different? They're not as we think they are. And what if we had the power to be able to consciously, that word again, consciously change our perspective? And in doing so, we change our mood. So, for example, um, it's called reframing. You're, 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 looking at, you're looking at something in a different way, a different frame, so hence reframing. And it's like um, taking a photograph from different angles. Imagine this bowl of fruit, you've taken the photograph, there you go, it looks like a bowl of fruit, but you move the camera, take another picture, and it looks completely different. It looks like a smiley face, but it's still the same bowl of fruit. Um, you just looked at it differently. Something else has come through. Nothing has actually changed about the bowl of fruit, only the angle at which you take the photograph. Similarly, you're looking into a window, looking into a room, sorry, through a window, and you see the back of a chair. Could be a little bit ominous, could be a little bit scary. Don't know who's sitting in the chair. But if you look at it from a different angle, a different window, there's a smiley person with a cat on their lap. And everything is different and a nice rug, and suddenly it becomes warm. So the room is the same. All that has changed is the way that you have looked at it through different windows. What a difference in outlook. One is a little bit threatening, the other is very welcoming. We can do this very easily. We can do this with our own mind very easily, but we don't realize we can. So we were gonna just take a moment now just to demonstrate that. So listening we've talked about and you'll see listening demonstrated now, but Jill and I are just going to um, coach each other. Um, we never, this isn't role play, we're just gonna coach each other and we're just gonna show an example of how reframe might change um, someone's perspective. And again, the invitation here for you is just to think about, um, yeah, what would that, what might the gift, what might the power of being able to um, have people who can quickly and effectively reframe either themselves or for each other 
what might that how might that impact your school um so because we've had a really busy day <laughs> do you want to coach me or shall i coach you uh i'll coach you okay and um, we're so. just gonna do a a few a few moments a few minutes five minutes what how are we doing for time yeah 335 so five minutes on reframing okay so matt hall what have you got at the moment that you could do with just playing around with looking at maybe differently yeah What's i do have something out? actually um, you know. so the thing that springs to mind is as you know jill we have recently after a long time moved into a new house um and it's great. It's literally, uh, well, I don't need to tell you the details. Um, it's, it's taken a long time, partly because of COVID, to get to the house over the, over the purchase line. We now own the house. We now moved into the house. Um, and the big bit of me knows it should feel great, but <laughs> we've got two dogs, a cat, two rats, three children under the age of 12, and about, I think, about 90 boxes of unpacked stuff. Um, it doesn't feel great at all. It feels really stressful. And I work full time. Sarah, my wife's about to go back to work as a doctor. I just, I literally have no idea when we get this house to look the way we want it to look. And it just feels a bit, oh. Okay, so how do you think it feels stressful? Give me a few other words um, to describe how it feels at the moment. Stressful. Um, messy. Mm. Um, chaotic uh incomplete just i like feel like I'm, i've moved into a storage unit not a beautiful house in the scottish highlands it's and it's, it's overwhelming actually i think that's the word there's so much yeah. we moved in we moved in a hurry again as you know um, but it will help explain why i feel like this so there's no sorting out of anything. We've literally got boxes with, uh, you know, open box, the biggest com randomest combination of junk in it. There's not even, a, oh, that's a nice neat box that goes in the kitchen. It's like, there's a box and there's also stuff in there for every other room. And half of it we don't even need. It could probably go to the tip. I don't want to take it to the tip oh. because that's a waste of stuff. There's people here. It's a pandemic. People are struggling. We should be giving it away. Should we give it away? Maybe we should sell it. Close the box overwhelmed that's what it is overwhelmed okay so um let's let's um that feels pretty heavy and it feels oh it feels yeah it feels really overwhelming actually it sounds like you're uh i'm gonna use that metaphor or like of drowning a bit it feels like you you having to kind of come up for air a little bit amongst mm. the mess mm. um so let's imagine that you, you, you're kind of, you know, your head's just above the water. You're kind of almost drowning in all this mess and you've been looking forward to it so much and it's all, oh, but imagine something or someone is lifting you out of that water. You're now up on dry ground uh, and actually something's now lifting you further up, so high up into the sky that you're now looking back down into your house. Um, and yeah, what can you see from up there in the sky, looking back down at your house? um yeah it's quite a useful description actually because there's they've left us quite a few aerial photos of the house um that are kind of dotted around the house and yeah i can just see a lovely white house with a beautiful garden around the outside kind of in a really lovely with the forest behind it and the sea in front of it um yeah that's all i can see i can't see any boxes because they're all inside <laughs> Okay, so uh, what, what's this feeling looking at the house with the um, beautiful house and the sea? And... It feels, yeah, it feels, it does feel a bit different. I can still, my mind's still going to, yeah, but once you wait till you open the door. Okay. Um, yeah, it almost feels like it's back in its original, my original image of it, which is okay. this stunning white house with a big garden by the sea. Hmm. Yeah. And so there's, um, okay, it's stunning, it's by the sea, it seems this white house, is there a purity there, am I getting sense of, is it simple, I don't know. Is yeah, it, no, it is, it is a very simple building, it's really okay. simple, it's one of the things I like about it, it's really mm. simple. Mm. Yeah, it's simple, it is simple, it's not, there's not much, 
it's a simple right angle of a building. Um, so what and it's you, all white. Okay, and it's all white. Beautiful. So what if you saw these boxes? Um, what would be the simple way to approach the boxes? What would be the clean way to approach these boxes that at the moment feel messy? What would you do? One by one. One by one? Yeah. Methodical, that sounds good. Yeah, it's just one by one. It's just one by one. I don't know, I feel like, before I felt like I needed to rush it. I don't know why. It's like a rush to get it done, but that's just impossible. Mm. So it's almost like each, each box is actually, it is quite neat and simple. They're all well packed and mm. they're all kind of there. So it's just, yeah, one by one. Who would you involve in the unpacking? What's the simple, this clean way? Uh, would, it, would it just be you? Would it be your whole family? Would it? Yeah, it's a clean way of, and simple way of doing that. Do you know what? Come on, now, now you're saying that. I don't think it's clean. I don't think it can be clean and simple with the chaos that is our family. I think it's, it's more that we need to make it part of the fun. I think it's that. I think it needs to be part of the fun. Mm. Like it feels like a chore and it can't be a chore. So this is lighter. And the house represents fun because the house is about moving somewhere where we could swim and paddleboard and walk the dogs and go mountain biking. And yeah, it needs to be, it feels that, yeah, it needs to be part of the fun. That's yeah, it's lighter because it's just part of the process. It's not the, doesn't need to be heavy. It doesn't need to be a chore. Mm. It's uh, where do we put all of our stuff? This is fun. Yeah. Great. That so, feels better. Okay. That yeah. feels better. So what are you going to do when you get home tonight? Shout out the kids. Um, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to tell Sarah, my wife, that that's because she would say that anyway. It's only me that's grumpy about it, that we just need to find the fun in it and turn it into a game. Yeah, great. Um, Give me a box. Turn it into a game and not and and accept that when we're finished we're finished it does there doesn't need to be done by a certain time um it doesn't need to be ready before my business partner visits if she is allowed to based on uk guidance yeah that's better thanks good marvelous marvelous okay so um thanks jill that was um quick bit of coaching that feels useful that feels my, my perspective's changed um yeah thanks jill Not at all. Sorry, I saw my, my initials. Um, so yes, the question is again for you, um, how powerful would it be to have this skill embedded in your school? Um, you know, there is that thing where if you're in a leadership position or not, you could be anywhere and someone might try and offload their woes of the world onto you. Um, if you had the skills or other people had the skills as well to be able to encourage a different mindset or perspective and be able to reframe a negative into a positive, or not even a negative, a view that doesn't serve them to a view that does serve them. Um, how powerful would it be to have that uh, ninja-like skill in your school? What, what would happen? What, what would it enable? What would it enable? Again, if you want to write in the chat function or q and A, be really helpful and good to hear your views. We'll just give people a few minutes to do that. Mm -hmm. acknowledging Sarah's point that it takes a while to type sometimes. Yes, absolutely. And maybe while people are reflecting or people are typing, I'm just going to yeah, just to give, give some examples of schools and education organisations that um, are now using coaching in a whole range of different ways. And I'll touch in a minute um, upon um, what those ways are. But, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting time for coaching in schools. And I know many schools have had coaching cultures and coaching training well embedded for a while, but it certainly does seem like more and more are doing so. Sarah adds, we often ask ourselves the questions about what our best hopes would be. This helps to change the perspective towards our preferred futures. Well, that's lovely. Yeah, that's a lovely reframe question. What would our best hopes be rather than staying stuck on the problem? 
um, yeah, what would our preferred future? That's a great, great coaching question. And um, I'm only so sorry that Sarah, that our previous course didn't run otherwise. <laughs> I would have loved to have continued that conversation with you in that, in that previous course. Let's hope, let's hope a future one does. Um, okay, so just, just a bit more, bit more detail. So we've looked at um, how um, coaching can help and we've touched on a couple of skills. We've looked at our model We've looked at the theoretical basis for it and some of the research. Um, those organizations that I just shared just um, are using it in a whole myriad of different ways. And one of the most important things about introducing coaching into a school is you stay true to coaching, the coaching principle that that organization or those individuals knows what's best for them. So we would always advocate that you introduce it and use it to shine the light wherever you need to, as opposed to saying, I'm going to introduce coaching to sort out this. I'm going to introduce coaching to sort out that. It is a really um, powerful tool, um, but it is not ever an off the shelf. It should never be a, I will introduce this to sort out lesson observations, or I will introduce this to sort out our performance development. Mm. Um, it should be complementary to whatever processes and systems you've got in place. Um, and what we normally find is people introduce it with a slight focus, but then it always evolves. Um, over time there's not a one uh, one one size fits all model for any school um, there's it always has to be unique to the school and the setting um, by, will of, by, by way, way of illustration some schools in China which we do a lot of work with um, schools in the Dulwich group using it specifically for well-being so they're introducing coaching as a way of improving the quality of conversations between staff and between staff and students with a real focus on growing well-being we've got other examples of schools that use it very specifically as groups to coach their business teams so the teams that support um, their staff um, and their teachers you know the bursa the marketing admissions um, finance teams go through a group coaching process we've got um, other school groups that provide um, leadership coaching for all of their senior leaders um, and those leaders um, uh, work with one of us or one of our teams uh, one of our associates to receive one-to-one -one coaching um, and so on and so on. There's a myriad, myriad of ways in which it can be deployed. And as I say, we'd always counsel against just saying, I'm going to get it to sort that, mm -hmm. um, bring it and then see how the organization needs it and wants to use it. So we're coming towards the end and we are coming up for time. Uh, but if you are interested in taking this further, then we are running um, a course in partnership with ECIS, um, which is an introduction to coaching in schools. It's an opportunity to explore a lot of what we've talked about today, as well as a few other skills. Um, and most importantly, start to practice it and think about it, how it would think about how it would work in your context. Um, we're doing that um, in what I was about to say, not for a while, but I've just realized the 20th and 21st of November are quite soon. Um, so we're doing it deliberately. You might gasp with uh, with horror that it's on a Saturday morning um, but we're doing that quite deliberately knowing how busy people are and knowing how hard it is to um, find time to access CPD at the moment um, so it takes place on a Friday afternoon and a Saturday morning split into two three-hour sessions um, it'll be run by Jill and I um, it will be extremely experiential um, instead of me being coached you'll be getting some coaching you'll be coaching each other it's completely live and online. There's no pre-recorded content. Um, and it'll be a real opportunity to um, think about both how much coaching might work for you as well as how it might work for your school. And um, Joe has very kindly just pinged in the chat the link to where you can register for that if you are interested. Um, and if you're interested but you don't want to register, then do just ping us a message either on Twitter or using the email address there, or hang around at the end of this webinar and we can answer any of your questions directly. But speaking of questions, now is the time, um, if you have any, to, to throw them in. Yeah, if you just want to pop either your questions in the Q&A box or the, um, the chat box, um, just making sure that you are clicking for all panellists, um, not just attendees, so our panellists do see the questions. Um, that would be fantastic. 
it's great Matt and Jill I always, I always love seeing seeing the coaching part of these these webinars and getting some good tips um, so thank you so much for including that again again for this webinar hmm, not at all our pleasure good I don't think you've got any questions coming in um, but again if you do have any questions please please reach out I know that Matt and Jill will be always happy to answer um, any questions that you might have via email um, I will make sure that when I send around the recording of this webinar I do include their emails um, so you can reach out directly to them um, to them as well and I will also include more information about the two-day workshop um, that Matt mentioned earlier Thank you so much, both Matt and Jill, for your time today. It's been amazing. Um, and hopefully, Matt, you sort some of your boxes out. Um, I'm, I'm sure you know. it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Big fun experience. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you once again. And thank you all for joining us, joining us today. And we hope, I hope you have a lovely afternoon um, or day. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.